What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Don't Give Up The Shit Podcast. This is the second edition, the second volume of the Heritage episodes. I'm really excited about this one. I kind of dropped dime on my, <laughs> dimes on myself with uh, the when the social media thing malfunctioned. So uh, everybody kind of already knew this was coming. I was I wanted to surprise everybody, but I screwed it up. But uh, this one is the Loretta Walsh story. Uh, I'm pretty excited about this one. It, it took me a minute to do the research. Um, wasn't as easy to come by the, the type of information I wanted. I had to get a couple of books. Uh, I'm really glad I did, well, especially uh, a book called The First, The Few, The Forgotten. Uh, the authors are Jean Ebert. Ebert. I'm not sure. I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm pronouncing that right. And Marie Beth Hall. Um, I got it on Amazon. Great book. It's it links in the description and an outline that I'll I'll get up on the website. Um, but it's a really great book with a lot of really cool, uh, almost like more personal information, almost like um, it's biographical instead of just like some of the stuff I got from Wikipedia and some other links on the History and Heritage Shaman website, but really excited about it. I got some great information that I thought I, I, I thought and I think uh, you guys will really enjoy. Um, and I, I had a great time just writing the outline. Like I got some really cool pictures I'm going to share on Instagram before I put the episode up just of like the uniform. They're like the drawings right out of the regulations and just a really cool. I, I love history. I get really excited about it if you can't tell already and if you didn't already know. But let's get into it. Uh, so chief heritage is obviously, as I've discussed in the past, something that for obvious reasons is, is close to my heart. Uh, each year during the chief season, we like play trivia and, and teach and train uh, selectees on kind of the importance of heritage. And we try to imbue some of the stories, um, which one of which I've always loved. And, and it's the story of the first female chief. And it's something that we ask a lot just to, we play a little stump the chump cause it's fun, but like <laughs> we, uh, we do it a lot uh, and, and spend a lot of time talking about it and even build some of the events uh, of the crucible event or final night, as we like to call it around heritage events that happened uh, specifically related to chiefs, but also some others. And just it's part of it is to drive home the, the importance of, kind of remembering these things and passing these stories on, but also uh, it's a very powerful tool to make somebody passionate or help somebody become passionate about the leadership responsibility that comes along with being a chief. Uh, So Loretta Perfectus Walsh became the first American active duty Navy woman, uh, the first woman to enlist in the United States Navy, and the first woman allowed to serve as a woman in any United States armed force except for uh, as a nurse. And then uh, it's she enlisted in the U.S. Naval Reserve on March 17th, 1917. Walsh subsequently became the first woman U.S. Navy chief petty officer when she was sworn in as a chief yeoman on that same date. Or excuse me, <laughs> she was sworn in on March 21st, 1917. So a couple days later. So the first thing that attracted me to the story of Loretta Walsh was her incredible middle name. Like, I remember hearing it for the first time and I was like, that's not real. And then I started doing the research and her middle name, of course, being Perfectus. Uh, I'd always smile when hearing a chief quiz a selectee on the first female chief and then hear them invoke her full first, middle and last names. It's it's almost never somebody saying Loretta Walsh. You almost always hear a chief when giving them the answer or uh, correcting them or whatever. You hear Loretta Perfectus Walsh. Uh, however, upon researching, she was far more than just an amazing name. Uh, she was an amazing woman, amazing sailor and chief who gave everything for what she believed. So a lot, and I I wanna make sure that I drive this point home, a lot of the information is taken directly from the book, The First, A Few, and The Forgotten, which I mentioned before. I highly recommend picking up this book. Uh, I also have another book linked uh, in the description, as well as a ton of articles from the History and Heritage Command website, Wikipedia, and some others. Um, Check all those things out as well, but this book gets into a lot of not just great information about Loretta Walsh, but about the yeoman, yeomanettes or yeoman F uh, and, and just the history of uh, Navy and Marine Corps women in World War One. So I highly recommend the book. Uh, and again, link is in the description to it'll take you right to Amazon where you can pick it up. So uh, I'm going to start with her background. So Walsh came from a family of achievers. Two of her brothers and one of her uncles were physicians. Another uncle was a county superintendent of schools. And one of her aunts had run a business while rearing a family of 10 
children. <laughs> Not only was she patriotic, she was also intelligent, diligent, and highly personable. When Lieutenant Commander Payne, who was her recruiter, asked if she was willing to enlist uh, and explained all that it might entail, she enthusiastically agreed. Payne promptly called the press uh, and told them to come to uh, the Naval Home the next morning to witness a historic event. Uh, the Naval Home is a residence for needy, retired, enlisted men, and at the time was located on the grounds of the Naval Hospital in Philadelphia. They came, and by the next day, newspapers across the nation had the story. The New York Times put it on page two. So Lieutenant Commander Frederick Payne, the recruiting officer for 4th Naval District, headquartered in Philadelphia, was discussing with his superior officer the idea of enlisting just one woman, which would dramatize the Navy's need and thereby spur male recruiting. There was so much talk about the Navy enlisting women that the man in charge of personnel at the Washington Navy Yard prepared to enroll his niece as the first Navy woman other than a nurse. Regardless of where and when and with whom it originated, the idea of enlisted women would probably have languished had not Secretary of the Navy Josephus, Josephus, I'm probably butchering his first name, I think it's Josephus Daniels, immediately endorsed it. In mid-March 1917, he announced after careful reading of the Naval Reserve Act, nothing can be found which would prohibit the enrollment of women. On the contrary, it is believed that their enrollment was contemplated. Thus, the Navy now had new and previously untapped source of persons capable of performing special and useful service. War events quickly led up to Walsh's decision to enlist in the United States Navy. World War I was in its fourth year when, on January 31st, 1917, the Germans announced they would resume unrestricted submarine warfare on all ships, including those sailing under the United States flag. Uh, I dorked out on some of this with like World War I. I just did a college class on it. and uh, Basically, there was a couple of attacks on civilian shipping where they said, hey, we're neutral. And Germany said, no, you're not. No one's neutral. If you're in this zone, we will sink you. And there was a couple of ships that included a, a lot of Americans that kind of led to outcry uh, and it was one of the reasons pointed at, even though there's a lot of other reasons why uh, the United States ended up joining in on World War One. So on February 23rd, 1917, American opinion further was angered when America learned of Berlin's proposal uh, for, to, for Mexico to join at the war as Germany's ally against the United States. Over the next few weeks, four American ships fell victim to German U-boats. That was the ships I was talking about, uh, causing the death of 15 Americans. Uh, the Lusitania being one of them, and there was a couple others. So on March 12th, 1917, all American merchant ships were ordered to be armed in war zones. On March 13th, 1917, these armed merchant ships were authorized to take action against German U-boats, uh, and it was in the face of this adversity challenging the United States that Walsh made her decision to enlist in the United States military. At age 20, on March 17th, 1917, Walsh engaged in a four-year enlistment in the United States Navy, becoming the first active-duty Navy woman in a non-nurse occupation. On March 19th, 1917, the Navy Department authorized enrollment of women in the Naval Reserve with ratings of yeoman, radio electrician, or other essential ratings, becoming the first branch of the United States Armed Forces to allow enlistment by women in a non-nursing capacity. Walsh subsequently became the first woman Navy Chief Petty Officer when she was sworn in as a Chief Yeoman on March 21st, 1917. Twelve days after Walsh was sworn in as a chief yeoman, President Woodrow Wilson went before the U.S. Congress late on April 2nd to ask for a declaration of war, which Congress did on April 6th, 1917, uh, and that's when the United States entered World War I. So now I'm going to talk about uh, the yeomanettes, which is kind of like almost a nickname for uh, what you'll see called yeoman f you'll see it written as the traditional spelling of the yeoman rating and then in parentheses you'll see an f next to it for female so in 1917 women had served in the united states military as nurses since 1901 however despite their uniforms army and navy nurses were civilian employees with few benefits for example women lacked relative ranks and insignia retirement pension disability pension if injured in the line of duty uh, the first american woman enlisted into the regular armed forces were 13,000 women admitted into active duty in the Navy and Marine Corps during World War I, and a much smaller number admitted into the Coast Guard. The Yeoman F recruits and women Marines, and it's that's a, a distinction that the Marine Corps uh, made, was like, look, we're not going to call them anything fancy. They will be Marines. Primarily served in clerical positions. 
They received the same benefits and responsibilities as men, including identical pay, which at the time was $28.75 per month. Uh, Keep in mind, this was the early 1900s and were treated as veterans after the war. These women were quickly demobilized when hostility ceased. And aside from the nurse corps, the the soldiery became once again exclusively male. Some black women served as yeoman F or yeomanettes and were the first black women to serve as enlisted members of the U.S. Armed Forces. These first black women to serve in the United States Navy were 16 yeoman Fs. The total ended up rising to 24 uh, and worked in the muster roll division at the Washington Navy Yard. On enlisting in the Navy in early 1917, Walsh became a yeoman F, commonly referred to, as I mentioned before, yeomanettes. Initially offered general discharges, the women veterans successfully lobbied for honorable discharges after the war in recognition of their service. Many continued in government service as civilians. Women veterans joined the newly created American Legion in large numbers, forming posts that were all female or overwhelmingly female in larger cities or joining mixed units in other areas. The first all-woman American Legion post was formed in Boston, Massachusetts, with Daisy May Pratt as its first commander. The National Yeoman F Association began in 1926. Uh, You'll hear that referred to later as NYF and was chartered in 1936 under Title 36 of the United States Code. The last surviving Yeoman F was Yeoman Second Class Charlotte Winters, who died on March 27, 2007 in Boonesboro, Maryland. And now I'm going to talk about their uniforms, which I, I'm going to share some pictures before I share the episode. So check them out on Instagram. And then just there's links in the description for the History and Heritage Command website where it will take you to very in-depth descriptions of the uniforms with some other pictures. Uh, very cool stuff. And uh, I'm going to start with a quote that I pulled from the book that it says, Till it wilted, I wore it. I'll always adore it. My real U.S. Navy blue gown. And that was former Yeoman F. Virginia Kerrigan adapting lyrics of a popular World War I song to uh, her pride in her in her Yeoman F. uniform. Uh, so as soon as Loretta Walsh agreed to enroll in the Naval Reserve, Lieutenant Commander Payne notified the press that a very newsworthy event would take place at the Naval home the following morning. 21 March 1917. He had already arranged for Walsh's physical exam and now needed only to come up with a uniform. Uh, He got together with his wife and her sister and they devised an outfit that suited the occasion perfectly. Her hat, much like those worn by commissioned officers, an unstiffened white crown rising from the black band encircling her head with a stiff black bill straight over her forehead. On the band, centered over her forehead, was the chief's insignia, which is an anchor, as you know, with a rope twisted around its shank, which is called fouled or a fouled anchor. Her jacket was made of dark blue serge, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. I, the fabric spelled S-E-R-G-E. Uh, double-breasted with brass buttons and a belt that was sewn across the back. Under the jacket, Walsh wore a white shirt waist with a black four-in-hand tie, and I'm I'm not uh, like I've seen the pictures, obviously, but like I'm not sure what is what is like I'm, I'm trying to envision them as I'm describing them. And I've never heard of certain clothing items referred to in this way. So uh, forgive me. <laughs> Her skirt was dark blue, ending just above the ankle, revealing black hose and shoes. She looked unmistakably Navy and unmistakably feminine. Some subsequent photos showed her carrying a pistol and one cartoonist portrayed her wearing a saber. Payne later claimed, proudly and accurately, that the official uniform eventually prescribed by the Navy for the Yeoman F closely resembled the one that Walsh Walsh wore as she took her enlistment oath. Perhaps spurred by the cartoonist images of pistol and saber, which assuredly had no place in the plans for the women, the Navy promulgated a description of a uniform for women enrolled in the Naval Reserve on 17 April, less than a month after Walsh uh, had enrolled. It appeared first as a memorandum and then as change two. Uh, it was inserted into the current, and that could be change 11, by the way. <laughs> it looks like change two in Roman numerals in the book, and I'm not 100% sure, and I tried searching for it and couldn't find it. But I did find a lot of other links that give you all of the information uh, on the uniform stuff, which is all in the in the uh, description uh, for the History and Heritage Command website stuff. But um, it was inserted in the current uniform regulations as change two or 11. Not sure. The memorandum described only uh, a coat and skirt. The coat was like that worn uh, by male chief petty officers, except that it was single breasted and the skirt's hem was to come four inches above the ankle bone. 
These items were to be of plain navy serge. Again, don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Or white drill cloth. Uh, and women were not required to wear them, but they were to wear an official pin, the Naval Reserve Force device, when on active duty. If they did wear a uniform, they were to wear only what was specified. Uh, and a later description was published as change in uniform regulations number 15, which makes me think it's 11, but I'm not sure the previous one. It specified the coat and skirt in greater detail and added descriptions of shirtwaist, neckerchief, hat, hose, shoes, and gloves. So moving on, uh, as Loretta Walsh's service went on, it kind of became uh, later defined by uh, influenza. So I'm going to talk about fighting the flu uh, because a large part of her service involved that. And then basically what ended her life involved that quite a bit as well. So uh, 56 women died while in Navy service, most of them from influenza. In Philadelphia, Loretta Walsh caught the disease in the fall of 1918. The city came close to collapsing before the disease ran its murderous course there, eventually killing almost 16,000. Since doctors could offer no medicines, the lack of nurses to care for the sick and dying was more critical, and anyone who could care for them uh, had to pitch in. So Walsh, in addition to her regular duties of recruiting and selling Liberty Bonds, helped nurse sick men and women stricken with influenza uh, in the Naval Hospital. And she never rec truly recovered from the flu and weakened by lack of rest, grieving over her older brother's death, and that aforementioned flu. Uh, she developed tuberculosis and remained hospitalized until her death in 1925. So... Now I'm going to kind of get into her legacy and some memorial stuff um, done after her death. So uh, she died months before the formation of the National Yeoman F or NYF that uh, that I found or I mentioned previously. Uh, so she died months before it was founded. Her death and what she symbolized as the first of the women to have enlisted in the U.S. Navy were integral to their sense of preserving the memory of their service in the NYF. Uh, so when the NYF sought to have her remain, her remains in, uh, reinterred at Arlington, the government gave them a single plot at, next to the first and allowing enough room for a monument that would stand in honor of all Navy women who had served. Uh, when every effort to secure the second plot and the memorial failed, the women had to abandon the project. But in Walsh's hometown of Oliphant, uh, Pennsylvania, the historic figure was already interred at St. Patrick's Cemetery in an unmarked grave. When members of the American Legion, Raymond Henry Post, number 327 in Oliphant, learned of her burial site, they undertook uh, a, like a, a campaign to raise money uh, for a memorial dedicated to her memory. They, of course, invoked the help of the NYF to make a general uh, patriotic appeal to all veterans to subscribe to a fitting memorial. Uh, the Raymond Henry Post raised a little more than half the funds to purchase a gravesite and build the memorial, and the women veterans contributed the remainder. 2,000 people attended the memorial's dedication in October of 1937. High officials of the Legion attended, as well as state government dignitaries, uh, NYF Commander Irene Melito Brown, and past commanders Geiger O'Neill and Mabel Bond attended uh, and gratefully acknowledged contributions received from more than 1,000 former Yeoman F throughout the country, literally from coast to coast. On Walsh's gravestone, in addition to her name and dates of service, are engraved these words. Woman and patriot, first of those enrolled in United States Naval Service, her comrades dedicate this monument to keep alive forever memories of the sacrifice and devotion of womanhood. So, as I wrap this up, I like... I know it was a little it was a little shorter than I wanted it to be. But again, I had a really hard time finding information um, I, criminally difficult. Uh, it, it and I know some stuff gets lost uh, as history happens. And she died sh probably a little before it was widely recognized. This like the significance of her service was as widely recognized as it prob as it is now and and wasn't documented as well um but this book the first the few the forgotten again a large portion of what i just said was directly quoted from the first a few the forgotten by uh gene ebert or ebert and i'm sorry if i'm butchering your last name <laughs> and marie beth hall great book the link is in the description get it off amazon um and i some from wikipedia and from other sources on history heritage command website all the links i used are in the description 
Um, so if you want to go down the same rabbit holes I did to do the research and get a little more detail, uh, please do. It's, it's really interesting. But I, I wanted to talk about Loretta Walsh's trailblazing life and legacy and then why you should study and share the story with your sailors because I think it's so important. It's why I started doing the history segments in the first place. It's why I brought it back uh, with the, the history uh, and heritage like episodes on their own. Um, it's just, I just think it's really important. And for a lot of different reasons, I think it's important that these things just are appreciated. I think it's really important that these stories are continued, to, like continue to be shared and that, uh, they're used by you as leaders. And, and that's kind of the, the biggest key point for me is I'm really passionate about using these stories, uh, using these, using our story to, inspire sailors to do the incredibly difficult things that we do on a regular basis. I think it's a big deal. Um, and I think you see the pride and service come out when you, when you share these stories, when you use these stories to inspire, uh, you see like when you saw what happened on the Bonhammer shard, tragic as it was, the, the phrase don't give up the ship and the hashtag and everything was invoked constantly because they were incredibly proud of their ship. They were proud of the legacy. They were proud of what the name meant and they wanted everybody to know it. And that's a big deal. That's a really important thing. And I don't want anything to get lost um, as we get further and further away from things like this happening. I think it's really important that we talk about these things. I think it's really important that when you're examining them, you take the time to pull the lessons out of them. Um, Loretta Perfectus Walsh was first. She was the first woman in our ranks and did so at the outset of World War I. Think about that. Think about how different the world was and how much courage and determination it took to see that commitment through. I, I love stories like these. I love learning about how human beings stubbornly take on challenges, prove people wrong or right, and overcome every obstacle on their path to the legacy we all get to study and appreciate. Um, Loretta Walsh is an example for everyone to point at and say, like, look at her and, and look at what she did. I, I th These stories excite me, they inspire me, and I hope they do you. Uh, you as well uh, as a listener and as sailors and as veterans and whoever else is listening. Uh, I hope this is enlightening. I hope it inspires and empowers women wearing the uniform. Uh, and I hope that in doing that, you use this story and everyone listening uses the story uh, to to share and to inspire others and empower your sailors. I, I just can't say enough about how important I think this stuff is. Uh, was really excited to uh, finally get this episode done. And I hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, and girls. <laughs> Sorry, it's pronouns. I suck at it. Uh, if you need anything from us, have any questions, comments, concerns, suggestions, criticisms, whatever, hit us up. Don't give up the ship podcast at gmail.com. You can Facebook message me. Don't give up the ship podcast. Or you can DM me on Instagram or Reddit at DGUS Podcast or just DGUS Podcast on Reddit. We also have a sub there, uh, DGUS Podcast. You can come there and discuss the episodes, ask questions, reach out. You can talk to me, Chief Bob's on there, a bunch of people that I've interviewed are on there. Uh, so you can come on there and, and have discussions and ask questions and such. Um, but please, please reach out if you need anything ever. Uh, and then... Um, please like, share, subscribe, review all the things. It helps us get the word out. It helps information like this and stories like this get to the people that need them or want to hear them. Uh, I, it, I really appreciate any time anyone can do that uh, to help get the, get the word out. And uh, that's it. That's what I got for you today. Thank you so much for listening and don't give up the ship. <laughs> <laughs>